One of the best analogies for describing how living things evolve is the development of modern human languages. Many of the ways with which we compare living things in order to hypothesize about evolutionary relationships can directly apply to languages as well. And perhaps if one understands how languages can be classified in a fashion similar to how living organisms are, then an epiphany moment may arise about how taxonomy can be a powerful tool in understanding Earth's biodiversity. There are many parallels one can notice between a language's development and biological evolution. And the existence of these parallels is precisely what allows us to undertake classification with regard to the evolution of these languages. The first of these parallels is that the characteristics of languages' pronunciation and grammar can be thought to be directly analogous to a biological species' physical and genetic characteristics, which can then be used for reconstructing evolutionary relationships. Similar pronunciations and or sentence structure between languages are like having similar skeletons between species. And conversely, the more different the grammar and pronunciation rules are between the languages, the larger the gap of ancestry must be between them. As an example, comparing Irish Gaelic Plan war gone the Magale, Sawalia, Agasar Futna Krenya, er our la Nashanta Kellyer Hain. Tarimid Aram Banatin the Fela Padrig, a cur our Gakdinia, a taparch a Gellera, the Blena Shah, is come a Kayako and Yeran no Harsalia Tashid. To Russian. Oh, yeah, need my good vibrat. Mosna Oba, no chess, I ain't had you vibrat. Yah had you Oba. Yah does not see me sure about it, Yanima Guata vibrat. Would be like comparing the common raven with the Eurasian brown bear. They've got their distinctive characteristics, yet have similarities in structure that are much deeper and not as obvious. The second parallel is that variation exists on an individual basis, allowing for the constant opportunity for the language to change over time given the right circumstances. Everyone has their own unique take on the language they speak, even in their own native language, and having a way of speaking slightly different from everyone else is analogous to the wider inherent variation that every biological organism possesses in its population. Just as every individual in a population is unique in some way, we all speak in our own way through preferred vocabulary, sentence structure, and slight accents. This variation of language on an individual basis can be thought to be inheritable. Since language skills are not genetic characteristics that can be passed down through simple heredity, languages are instead inherited by being taught to young children or to non-native speakers so that they can speak it on their own. Then they themselves may become instructors for their own children or non-native speakers in the future. As a result of both intrinsic variation and inheritance occurring to a language, one should then naturally conclude that over time, as children and non-native speakers get a better hold of a language and form their own take on it, the language itself gets altered in tiny ways that may then result in new ways of using that language, through inventing new words and slang, new acceptable pronunciations, new idioms, new metaphors, etc. This is just like how genetic mutations in every individual of a species can gradually and incrementally change a species gene pool over time to result in new characteristics and adaptations. However, since both biological species and languages are not drastically changing every day or every generation, we can notice that there is a form of natural selection keeping these changes in check. Just as the surrounding creatures and climate keep a species gene pool from changing in every which way, grammar rules and social connotations for words tend to keep languages from easily breaking off into infinitely different directions. Just as biological species do, languages can go through a sort of genetic trip when an ancestral stock splits into two or more isolated groups, causing the rules and regulations of language used in the ancestral language to no longer apply and keep linguistic changes when building up in the new daughter groups, to first form an accent, then a dialect, up until the daughter language changes sufficiently to lose what is called mutual intelligibility, the ability for their respective speakers to understand each other. At the point where two different ways of speaking completely lose the ability to make sense of each other, they both ought to be considered completely different languages. This rule of using mutual intelligibility to gauge the closeness of two or more ways of speaking is directly analogous to how genetic closeness can gauge the closeness of two or more different populations of biological organisms. In the same way that biological taxonomists use species as a distinct unit that are then combined to form larger groupings, we can use languages to build nested hierarchies that might represent their evolution through time. A good example of this phenomenon of mutual intelligibility would be if we looked at the main languages of the three mainland Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. We're all familiar with the fact that these countries mainly speak the northern Germanic languages of Danish, Swedish, and Bukmore Norwegian, respectively, save for the many regional dialects, looking at you, Norway. But it turns out that these three tend to have a high degree of mutual intelligibility among each other, aside from some vocabulary changes and pronunciation differences. Their similarities can be noticeable even if we don't speak it ourselves. Det kan den være sådan noget om hvor ofte vi bløder, hvor mange liter vi bløder ud. 
Måske ikke lige når jeg minder om mængde. Hvis I bløder en hel liter ud, når jeg minder om så skal I omgå det syge læge. Eller ej, se lige den her video færdig først. Smid et like, følg mig på Instagram, og så ring efter lægen. Og hvis I også lige kan få lægen til at følge mig på Instagram, nu er jeg i gang, så får vi faktisk slået virkelig mange fluer med et smæk. Svend, hvad har vi gjort? Er vi fast her på grund af en livsform, det er vel for jævligt? Jeg ved. Jeg vet. Det er, det er jævligt, altså. Men hvad skal man gøre, liksom? Altså, ja... Ja, jeg forsøker den da. Vi har vært i samme så lenge, du og jeg, PewDie, og... Nu kan ikke vi ens lemme det her rummet. Ja, ja, det har jo ikke ihop, liksom. Nu måste vi hitte en nyckel. Ok, Sven. Men hva er det nyckelen? Hva er det nyckelen? Her stol, vet du hva nyckelen er? I don't, I don't know, Pity. I'm sorry. I don't have a key. I promise. Hey, oil. Do we have a key here? I mean, jævla nyckelfanskap. Kan du vara någonstans? Kan du vara under den här sängen? Nix. Kan du vara under den här saken där? Nix pix. Ja, en tårnebåne. Fan vad trevligt, en tårnebåne. Hahaha. <laughs> right. Då startar vi. Så hur har dagen min varit? Dagen min har varit super. Ja, oh, vad har du gjort? Jag har varit på jobb med alla de små barnen. Ja. Oh. Och vi har lagat lussekatter. Oh, wow. Ja, väldigt kosligt. Yeah. Hva har du gjort i dag da, Karin? Vi har også vært på jobb. Jeg har jeg hadde laget juletre. Har du laget juletre? Ja, av papp. Og så har vi limet og klippet av. Alle barna har vært flinke. Ja, har du vært flink også? Jeg har vært veldig flink. Det er veldig bra. Mm, og så slapp jeg å være ute, for det var dårlig vær. Ja, ja, jeg slapp å være ute i dag. Ja, så deilig. Så fantastisk. Ja. These three languages are so similar, probably due to the close history all three countries share, that they say that Norwegian is Danish spoken in Swedish. This brings up a question. If someone speaking Norwegian can understand a good portion of what someone says in Swedish or Danish without necessarily needing formal learning classes, should they really be considered separate and distinct languages, or could they just be far removed dialects of some common Scandinavian language? Maybe this charred force of the mainland northern Germanic languages are in some sort of gray area, stuck in a transition stage of a common language splitting into distinct languages, while not quite fully so yet, unlike Faroese or Icelandic. This is directly analogous to how biological species can be thought to be once they start splitting from their ancestral stock, growing more and more genetically distinct over time, to the point where they can no longer breed with their ancestral population, becoming a new distinct population free to express new traits and characteristics. Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish might be considered as close in ancestry as the elk, red deer, and sika deer, among other possible comparisons. It's for this reason also why estimates for the total number of languages are not directly obvious, and can vary depending on how exactly one defines a language to be, leading to the lingual equivalent to what's called the species problem, which refers to how the term species can be hard to define depending on what exactly keeps one population from breeding with another. That's a topic for another time, but one of the factors that contribute to the ambiguity of species is this last parallel. This last parallel between how languages evolve and how living organisms evolve is the equivalent of horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is the ability for usually prokaryotic organisms to share genetic material with each other regardless of their ancestral history. This is a caveat of biology that does keep cladistics from being completely reliable when it comes to prokaryotic populations. There are no biologists who dismiss the tree of life with regard to animals and possibly another one for plants. I've argued myself that the tree of life is more the shape of a tumbleweed. But importantly, whether bush or weed or tree, it grows out of a web because single-celled organisms are far more prone to horizontal gene transfer. Microbes can, on occasion, pass their genes to other organisms on contact by a few different means. This makes taxonomic classification at the microbial level very confused because there isn't a single lineage, but very often several interconnected ones. Horizontal gene transfer happens in multicellular organisms too. 8% of the human genome came from viruses. But it's more difficult with multicellular organisms for obvious reasons. So the tree of life is still a verifiable fact of life. Languages can have their own form of horizontal gene transfer simply by using and modifying loanwords from other languages far removed from their close relatives. And just as this phenomenon tends to keep cladistics from dominating the classification scheme of all living organisms, it also keeps languages from being proverbial islands and only being products of their ancestral states varying and splitting over time. English is a perfect example with its influence from Latin, Greek, Old Norman, and Old Norse. Despite originating from the West Germanic language of the Anglo-Saxon tribes, it gained words from all of these other languages just as a bacterium might gain new genetic material from another bacterium that isn't necessarily its close relative. 
All of these are many of the major parallels that exist between biological evolution and language evolution, and recognizing these commonalities helps us to really get the full gist of how easily recognizable the effects of evolutionary principles can be. With such parallels existing between bioevolution and language evolution, their corresponding classification systems use similar methods like cladistics, and as a result, the evolution of these language families can be traced through time just as the evolution of biological population can be traced through time, where ancient writings of the extinct languages in the written record can often serve as analogs for the ancient remains of extinct creatures in the fossil record. And just like the fossil record, the written record only goes back so far before evidence disappears completely, leaving only speculative hypotheses to answer some deeper questions, like does all of human language spring from some common ancestral language, like a proto-human language? Just as speculative is the effect globalization will have on current languages in the future. Will all regularly spoken languages eventually coalesce into one language as South Park portrayed? <laughs> Or will they all be slowly snuffed out in favor of the language that simply has the most native speakers? These questions are very similar to questions evolutionary biologists and paleontologists ask about the evolution of living things, because evolutionary theory very nicely describes how living things, and in this case languages, can diversify over time. As such a theory of biodiversity, answering the equally interesting question, how exactly did these languages get started in the first place, requires knowledge that goes beyond evolutionary principles. Just like how the question of how life got started in the first place requires an understanding that evolutionary theory alone can't give, despite the straw man that many a creationist may erect. Speaking of, here's another question. If creation is subject to the ability for any degree of evolutionary change to occur to biological populations, must they then necessarily reject the ability for a language to change by the same processes? Would they have to appeal not to the Genesis story, but to the Tower of Babel story? Which, much like the Genesis story itself, doesn't really explain anything. Are there language kinds, even though every language has the capacity to take words and phrases from any other language? If not, how does a process guided by similar mechanisms then necessitate the existence of these kinds? As in, if we admit that all of human language might indeed spring from some common ancestor by processes involving intrinsic variation and natural selection, why wouldn't it then make sense that living things could have evolved by those same processes? After all, it would succinctly explain the existence of not just the genetic similarity of practically all living things yet known, but specific genetic orthologs unique to specific clades, in addition to endogenous retroviruses and physical characteristics that all fit and corroborate a practically seamless nested hierarchy of biodiversity. This video is like a prologue for another series I'm thinking of starting about the classification of human languages, because as a learner of five languages, I find it fascinating to know and appreciate how lingual cousins can be so different yet quite similar. Knowing how languages evolve also gives us insight for why exactly we speak the words that we use or how those words came to be, a field of study called etymology, which is just as interesting in its own right. If anyone is just as interested as I am, I have a ton of really good YouTube videos linked in the description that delve into what languages are, how they work, and how they change over time. And to any monolinguals who happen to be watching this, I encourage you to consider finding an exotic language that you find fascinating to listen to or speak. Not going yeah, yeah, to make yeah, yeah. it hard for you to make, to repeat them, <laughs> but that will be the clicking um, sentences, uh, starting with the C1. Uh, <laughs> at least so that your brain can get healthy exercise and perhaps so that you can make your own contributions to the language that you use every day.